Hello and welcome to another Kangaroo English Daily Digest. My name is Christian and today is Wednesday, the best day of the week. <laughs> Although I know that for some of you, Wednesday is not the best day of the week because it's like the middle of the week, the work week, you know, the weekend is so far away. <laughs> and, and that's why today I want to give you a little bit of motivation, a little bit of a push, a reason to get out there and use your English. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking just a little bit more about what I talked about in the previous Daily Digest, which was about these semantic primes. Okay, so if you want to know the detail, you can, you can watch the previous Daily Digest, but basically semantic primes are these universal, these universal concepts that, as far as we know, they exist in all languages. These concepts are part of being human. Things like um, good and bad, big and small, live and die, uh, verbs like say and do and move. Uh, and then maybe some also more abstract kind of things like truth, okay? And I also showed uh, in the previous digest how using only 60 of these concepts, you can explain anything. You can express yourself about any subject, even really complicated and untranslatable psychological concepts, right? Now, the, the thing is that one doubt, and I'm sure a lot of people have this doubt, is, well, okay, fine, but I don't want to communicate like a caveman, you know, I don't want to be like, you know, me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I understand that, but what this does is it gives you a really solid foundation, okay? And remember that simplicity doesn't mean that, you know, simplicity is not a synonym for stupidity. You know, simplicity is not a synonym for, it's not a synonym for ignorance, right? Simplicity is a beautiful thing. And there's another great reason to, to, to look at these semantic primes as a foundation for learning, and that's this, okay? So, um, this is a preprint, so it's not, it hasn't been peer-reviewed review, peer yet, but it will appear in cognition, okay? Um, and it's a couple of um, researchers from the University of Washington and some more from the University of Amsterdam, and they used a uh, neural network, okay? So, like a computers and artificial intelligence and they proved using this this neural network they proved that these semantic primes are easier to learn than other parts of language so for example they tested the neural network uh, on quantifiers okay uh, on prime quantifiers and non-prime quantifiers and also for, um, I think, uh, yeah, for color terms and the convexity universal, which is a bit more kind of, con uh, a bit more complicated. But yeah, so they proved that, that these semantic primes, these, these language universals are easier to learn. Maybe, maybe because, and it's a big maybe, but maybe because part of our physiology, right? Parts of our brain, we are born understanding these concepts, right? For example, no one has to teach you to be hungry. You know what it means. You know, your body tells you I'm hungry. No one has to teach you to be afraid of falling, right? You know, th these are things that are built into, built into us as humans and probably or maybe <laughs> these semantic primes like saying and moving are also built in so they're easier to learn, right? So that's another reason to use these concepts 
as a foundation for your, for your language learning. Okay? Now, we need to quickly move on to today's word of the day, which is hand. Hand. And there's a couple of interesting things about the word hand. Hand is, is recognizable in some European languages. You know, it's similar in some European languages, like in Swedish, for example. But then if you look at other European languages, the word is completely different, like in, like in Spanish, for example. Um, and, but the really interesting thing is that even though this is one of the most common and most robust words in, in the English language, we don't know where it came from. Its story is unknown. <laughs> right. But hand, you know, is a part of your body, but it can also be used as a noun. A hand can be a person who gives you a hand, right? Um, like a, a, a farm hand, person who helps you on the farm. Deck hand, person who helps you on the boat. It's a great little word. And we also have the hot hand. <laughs> now, if you are a fan of basketball, then you know about the hot hand, okay? It's a metaphor. The hot hand is when your hand is on fire. You can shoot the ball and you're always scoring. Three points, two points, slam dunk. He's got the hot hand, right? Now, there was, in, in psychology in the past, there was this idea of the hot hand, that basically you could be a basketball player and you could have the hot hand, which meant that you would always be scoring. You were on fire, right? And there was this really big period when... Serious scientists, you know, serious statisticians and, and, and psychologists, they looked at this and said, well, no, you know, it's, it's a fallacy. Basically, you think it's the hot hand, but when you really look at it, it's just coincidence. Or it's related to just uh, psychological, um, you know, beliefs that are not based in reality, right? But this is, this, is, this is super exciting. So this was published on September 19, 2019, just, just recently. And it's called, Is it a fallacy to believe in the hot hand in basketball? And they actually went and they looked at 29 years of basketball games, 29 years of basketball games, and they looked at all the data. And you know what they found out? They found out that there is considerable evidence of hot hand shooting in and across individuals. Now, why am I telling you this? What the hell does this have to do with, with, with language, right? What it means is that belief creates results, okay? Players who believe they have the hot hand, they score more. Right? We don't know why. What is this connection between belief and, and, and results? Could be lots of factors. Confidence, um, extra adrenaline, who knows, right? Who knows? But it's a real thing. And it's important for you because if you are scared of entering into a conversation, you're scared of, of, of doing it, right? Then you keep that fear with you, right? But then you have a small conversation using a, a semantic prime. You have a small conversation about feeling good or feeling bad or something big or something small. Okay, feeling good, right? Successful conversation. Then you have another one and another one and another one and suddenly you haven't got a hot hand, you've got a hot, you've got a hot mouth. Right? You're on fire. You believe that you can do things with your English. So you do things with your English and your results are better. 
And that's why it's important. Do not underestimate the power of psychology in the process of language learning. It, it, it could be everything, right? And I want to, to finish by um, telling you a couple of um, advantages of being bad at language. <laughs> okay? A couple of advantages. You know, maybe a lot of teachers will tell you that, you know, being bad can, can only be bad, but, but I'm going to prove to you that being bad at language can have benefits. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to publish an interview with Ev Fedorenko, okay, who is a cognitive scientist. We had an amazing interview. She's a very um, intelligent and, and knowledgeable uh, person. Um, and I have a couple of pieces of her research here that I want to talk about. So the first one is, is this, okay? Tracking co-listeners' knowledge states during language comprehension, okay? So what they did was they put, they put people, native speakers, in a room, okay? And they asked them to read sentences that didn't make any sense. For example, for example, um, the girl had a little beak, right? It doesn't make sense because, you know, girls don't have beaks, they're not birds, okay? So they asked them to, to read these sentences and they scanned their brains, right? And then they repeated the experiment, but when they were reading the sentences, there was another person in the room listening to these implausible sentences and they scanned their brains and here's the incredible thing there was a really big difference in one important part of their brain it's called the n400 effect the n400 effect is basically surprise but only for language okay so this part of your brain will will activate when you're like what that what did you just say okay but only for language. It's a really cool thing that they, that they discovered, okay? Now, when the people were reading the sentence alone, they were saying, the girl had a little beak. This N400 effect, this part of the brain that shows linguistic surprise, did not activate. But when they put them in the room with another person and they asked them to read the sentence, that effect appeared. And what it means is that when you are socially using language, you become empathetic towards the other person. The whole psychology of your, of your language use changes. And, you know, this is totally subconscious, right? Totally subconscious. So, when I say something like, the girl had a little beak, I'm surprised on your behalf. I'm surprised for you. We become connected in, in a very deep way through this, through this shared communication, which is pretty amazing, right? I mean, it's amazing to think that just another person can, can have an effect on the way that your brain is processing language. And what it means for you as a second language learner is that when people are talking to you and they know that you're not a native speaker, their brains are working differently. And I'm going to give you a specific example of that, okay? This is another, another piece of her work. Don't underestimate the benefits of being misunderstood, okay? So they did a similar thing, a similar thing, okay? But they had two groups. They had native speakers and non-native speakers with accents, with accents. So the native speakers would go in the room and say sentences like, the mother gave the candle the daughter. Okay, right. the mother gave the candle the daughter. And they would ask the people, well, how, how was this sentence? Did you understand it? Was it grammatically good or bad? Where was it, right? And then they did the, th the same thing with non-native speakers with a strong accent. Non-native speaker goes in 
uh, the mother gave the candle the daughter. And they said, okay, so what do you think of that sentence? Grammatically correct, rate it. Okay, listen to this. Um, uh, we demonstrated that native English speakers are more likely to interpret implausible utterances when the speaker has a foreign accent. So basically, basically, if you have a foreign accent, if your English is really bad, native speakers will understand you better because they, 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 their brain prepares themselves for bad English. Their, their brain prepares themselves for mistakes in grammar, in pronunciation. It makes them alert. Okay, I'm ready to understand deeper. So there's some advantages that you have as, as a terrible user of English. So my message today is that you don't need 20,000 words memorized using flashcards. You don't need to know all of the complicated structures of grammar. You don't need to have a perfect accent. You don't even need to really have a lot at all. What you can do is you can throw yourself into conversations with really basic concepts and you keep doing that you're going to have great outcomes, you're going to feel good, and you're going to get better every single day. And all of those native speakers that you're so afraid of speaking to, they are prepared in their brains to understand you, and they don't even realize it. Totally subconscious. <laughs> so, please... Don't hide anymore behind the workbooks and the exams and in those, you know, fake activities, okay? Go out and do something real. <clears throat> well, uh, this is Christian reporting. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed today's Daily Digest. Please, um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Follow me on social because I'm always posting wonderful things there. Uh, I'm Christian, this is Kangaroo English. I'll see you in class. <laughs>